Charles, you're very welcome to ScaleX Insider Podcast. I am absolutely delighted and thrilled to have you on the show today. Brendan, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. We've been chatting off air, and I've been really excited to, to, to pose this question to you, which I pose to all guests. Our vision is to inspire, connect, and enable millions of ambitious leaders of small and medium-sized enterprises to scale with purpose. So Charles, as the chair of Patagonia, what does scaling with purpose mean to you? Well, I, I love the term, you know, because it it, it um, captures two ideas that I think are really important. Um, one is that most living organisms need to grow in order to thrive. Um, but it also captures the critically important idea of purpose, um, because growth for growth's sake is entirely what's gotten into this, uh, us into this uh, terrible environmental dilemma that we're in today. And I think the idea of conscious growth thinking about why thinking about what we what purpose we serve and thinking about growth in the context of that purpose is incredibly important right and and exciting and you know at Patagonia that's been very much um really the life lifeblood and long-term vision of the company that's allowed it to exist for 50 years yeah and I'm going to get into that uh, later in the conversation I'm really excited actually to to understand a little bit more as to the principles that have undergirded and driven the success of Patagonia. But I want to kick off, firstly, congratulations on your wonderful book. For those listening, you'll not be able to see me holding up uh, Charles' new book, The Imperfectionist, Strategic Mindsets for Uncertain Times. And I've really enjoyed this book. The 10 principles of scaling, which we've defined within our ScaleX framework, lay out those principles for scaling, the first being psyche. Because actually mindset is cited and more aptly lack of ambition of the leader is cited as the single greatest impediment as to why SME leaders don't scale. And you've really gone deep on, on the mindsets of prolific scalers. So I want to kick off. I'd love to do a little mini masterclass in the book today, but how do you define imperfectionists, the, the imperfectionists? Yeah. Well, it's a funny sort of title for a book, isn't it? Um, and I guess what we were, you know, in, in the kind of environment we find ourselves in where everything's changing so quickly. I mean, and it's really true. We always think things are changing quickly, but now it's really true <laughs> that we have, you know, programmable biology, artificial intelligence, automation. We have war. We have su supply chain disruption. Things really are very different. And I think what it means is the old way we used to think about strategy, more like a chessboard that you kind of study and look back and you think about structure and players and performance. You can't really operate that way anymore. Um, in the world when it's changing as quickly as this, I think you have to think about strategy as dynamic problem solving. And so for us, uh, to be an imperfectionist is to accept that when things are changing quickly, you actually have to lean into that risk rather than rather than be paralyzed by uncertainty. And you have to make small moves that help you build capabilities, build understanding of the um, game that you're playing and inch out into risk and craft your strategy essentially as you go. Another way of titling it might've been experimentalist. Um, you know, Yvonne Chouinard, who's the founder of Patagonia likes to say, you know, you can do book learning style strategy. You can look at it from every angle, all the science. And by the time you get there, someone else is already there. Uh, a much better strategy is to step out, see how it worked. If it didn't work, step back. And if it did work, step forward again. Yeah. And I think it's that stepping out, which ultimately impedes people in the first place, because psychologically we have something uh, within us that is resistant to change, resistant to stepping out, whether that is fear of judgment, fear of failure, you know, what have you found in your research which prevents people from, from stepping out? Yeah, what's really interesting is, and I think this, you know, is bad in both little companies and big companies. So this isn't unique to um, SMEs and it's not unique to global champions either, which is risk aversion is deep inside us. And, you know, maybe that made sense, you know, when a little rustle in the bushes meant, you know, tiger about to eat you. Um, risk aversion was a really sensible approach. What it means today, though, is that um, we often don't even take good bets. You know, so a, a, a good bet is 
I, I know that <clears throat> the probability, it, you know, it costs me a dollar to play. The probability is 50%. The payoff is $10. This is a good bet. And what happens in all kinds of enterprises, people are afraid to make that bet. And sometimes that has to do with capital availability. That can be the case with SMEs. But often it's just baked inside people. And I think company cultures become risk averse. And that's because we punish people who make an experiment that fails. And the only time we should punish people is when they make a bad bet. Um, and that's when either they didn't think hard about the odds before they stepped out, or they made a bet that was very costly or irreversible. When those conditions don't exist, when people are making sensible bets, which have modest commitment and which are reversible, we should be celebrating not just the successes, but also the failures. Yeah. Mm. Here, here, and you document so many stories where people have stepped out and, and succeeded so, um, so profoundly. You lay out six mindsets for problem solving under uncertainty, which I almost see, you know, could read this as mindsets for scaling with purpose, because ultimately scaling with purpose is about stepping out and pioneering, moving into uncharted waters, uh, you know, breaking new ground for the first time. So as I mentioned at the outset, I'd love to do a little mini masterclass on those, on those mindsets. So you kick off in the book, I will just kind of follow, follow sequentially what, you, what you've laid out in the book, uh, being over curious about every element of your problem. So can you share what you mean by that, Charles? Yeah, and it, the reason we start with curiosity, and it sounds like such a basic thing, but somewhere around four or five years old, all of us uh, start to lose that sort of wonder about the world. And we, kids at age three, they ask something like 40 questions or 50 questions a minute right? They're constant. And this is how they explore the world. And they don't understand the patterns of the world yet. So they're constantly asking why. And then, you know, we start to be successful by, you know, for example, observing how to tie a bow knot on our shoe. And we then impose that pattern, you know, two pieces of, uh, of string, we tie them together with a bow, we impose that on every uh, two pieces of string that we come across. And that becomes true in everything we do, including how we see uh, life in our companies. And it's so critical to start every scaling journey or every strategic journey by stepping back and asking the question, why? Or how does that make sense? Or who else needs to be involved? Asking a series of questions rather than instantly jumping to be decisive. We often credit leaders with decisiveness as if that's a wonderful thing. Maybe it's a wonderful thing uh, to credit leaders with curiosity, uh, people who can actually turn their head a little bit and say, I wonder if, uh, if this other way might work. Right. And, uh, in the book, you know, I, I, one of the examples that I use here, I kind of love, which is, uh, the invention of instant photography, which was, uh, which was credited to Edwin Land, this amazing, uh, inventor, but really the credit goes to his daughter, Jennifer. Uh, they were walking around Santa Fe and, uh, <clears throat> in the 1940s. And uh, he was snapping pictures with his uh, Kodak camera. And uh, she said, Daddy, can I can I see the picture? And he said, he knelt down and he said, Well, no, honey, uh, the picture's taken on film, which is a chemical emulsion. And that needs to go to the laboratory. And uh, the lab will we'll take it to the drugstore. And that'll go to the laboratory in two weeks, we'll get the photos back, and we'll take, and he stopped himself. And he realized that she'd asked the right question which is why can't I see the picture? And in his mind, he immediately started working on how you could actually have that chemistry be instant. And before the end of the day, he was on the phone to his lawyer, who also happened to be in Santa Fe, and beginning to work on the intellectual property around instant photography. And I just, I love that, that childlike curiosity that would have you ask a simple question, right? Or Nespresso, you know, every morning people use these lovely Nespresso capsules. Where did that come from? Well, you know, it came from a giant company, Nestle. And how, how did they become an innovator? And the truth is they gave enough space to a young engineer who's called Eric Fev, who's actually a rocket scientist. They gave him enough space to be curious. And when he was traveling in Rome, he noticed there was a, 
all these coffee shops and one of them had a queue outside the door and the others didn't. It was called St. Eustatio's. It's still there. You can go there yourself. And he wondered, what's going on there? Right. And instead of just walking by, he went in and he noticed that there's this old barista who's called Eugenio and he's pumping this ancient espresso machine because he thinks it's malfunctioning. But what he's really doing is jacking all this air pressure into the coffee and makes this thick, beautiful crema on the top. And that's why people were queuing up for it. And he thought, I wonder if I could do that. Right. And Nestle gave him the room over eight years to come up with this idea. Yeah, I love the story in the book. And what's remarkable about that now, it represents an espresso sales represents something like seven billion dollars of Nestle's overall revenues, which is just incredible. Right. You have my mind going in lots of different places there. Firstly, it's the typically the impatience of leaders which I feel prevents them from actually stopping to ask why, because uh, implied within that is now a conversation, an exploration, more time required potentially. And, uh, you know, I, when actually I want to just get to the nub of the, the problem, so I'll not ask too many questions in case this uh, elongates the decision making progress process. What before we kind of get into how we can build this curiosity into the DNA of cultures and organizations, what must leaders do to begin with, especially those under pressure within SMEs to, you know, to to meet the end of month payroll, to win the next deal, to uh, you know they they're typically what I hear uh, really struggling for time. Time's always the, 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 the challenge that comes back to me. Even when we invite people into our program, I don't have the time. So what would you encourage leaders to do to begin to become and practice more curiosity if it's not innately there or they've lost it? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of times we, you know, time, time is the constraint, but a lot of times we, we don't even stop to bring the team together to have a session once a week and everybody can afford 45 minutes once a week to bring the team together to ask, what is it we're doing again? Yeah. Why are we doing this? Are, are, is how we're doing this actually making sense? Oh, you notice all these have little question marks on the end of them. And you can save yourself an enormous amount of time by asking good questions. Think about how much time we waste by doing the wrong things, right? how many processes we develop for one particular set of situations where all of a sudden when that situation changes, it's no longer required, but we still do that process. Um, we're encrusted with all of the detritus of our past decisions because we don't ask the question. And so I think you devote a little bit of time, which frees up enormous time. Yeah, I love that. It's super practical. Are there... Are there key questions that you have found, given your incredible career to date, that really incisively get to to the nub, you know, back to uh, the the young Miss Land when she asked that question? Are there some questions that we should habitually practice? Yeah, yeah, I think there are. I really do. And you know, the most important of those is why are we doing this? You know, when we make another uh, another pair of shorts at Patagonia, we have 30 other shorts already. There better be a good answer to the question, why are we making this new pair of shorts? And then the second question I think is really critical to have in your hip pocket is, um, is there a better way to do this? Is there another way of thinking about this? Again, we we get blinders because those blinders, that's the pattern imposition that grownups do, right? That kids don't do. Um, right? We, 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 we think we have pattern recognition, then we do pattern imposition. And we don't ask, is there another way of thinking about this? Yeah, I love that. And we'll come to that uh, with, the, with the second yeah. mindset. Uh, before we just move on to there, can you quickly uh, can you quickly describe the characteristics of those organizations who have who have curiosity built into their culture. I do think that that term I, I opened with, which is experimentalist, 
is really characteristic of companies that are curious. Um, they're constantly doing little experiments. If you're doing an experiment, you're asking, you're, you're trying to answer a question. And if you're not doing an experiment, you think you know the answer, right? And if you think you know the answer in the world that we're in today, you're tripping, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, I love that. And I always think of the importance of when you're seeking to do something new, rather than thinking that you have to commit to this forever and a day is to just test it. So say, well, okay, I'm going to test this for two days, or I'm going to test this for a week. Right. right. And why, why can't we think that way? Right. Yeah. And if we find that we've shipped product, experimental product to customers that actually we decide oh, later, you know, that's not really the right thing. Ship them the new thing, yeah. right. That'll delight them. Right. It'll show them that they, they actually, that you care. Right. Yeah. This won't frustrate them. It'll make them feel like you're authentic and that you actually care about their purpose. Yeah, I love that. I really loved reading and the way you describe the, the next mindset, having a dragonfly eye view. And I didn't understand this about the, uh, the characteristics of a dragonfly. Can you share with our listeners why we should take a dragon eye fly view? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, we use this as an analogy, and it's one we borrowed from uh, Philip Tetlock, who wrote, has written so convincingly about super forecasters. Um, dragonflies have these huge compound eyes that have, you know, some 30,000 lenses, and they have <clears throat> three additional single eyes that help them see not only <clears throat> nearly 360 degrees, but in spectra of light that we can only imagine, right? They can see colors and light in ways that we can't. We like that as an analogy for, uh, along with curiosity, before you settle in on an answer, to step back and ask the question, I wonder what this looks like from the perspective of our suppliers. I wonder what this looks like from the perspective of, a, of one of our customers, or maybe a prospective customer. What does this look like from one of the perspective of one of our competitors? You know, would they look at this and say, God, I can beat that. Or what about a potential competitor, an entrant? You know, are we offering up something juicy because we're doing something that's simple that doesn't actually meet purpose, yeah. right? And to sort of see it, and we call it, sometimes you call it environmental thinking, which is to step, step into different perspectives. Um, some companies call it, in fact, perspective taking. Um, and one of the things they do in their strategic workshops is actually to get people to take different perspectives. In a way, it's like assigning people roles. And when you look at things from the perspective of others in the ecosystem, you often catch yourself and realize, ah, oh, we're being fools. I really, really love this again, getting, getting super practical. This is the, the antidote or certainly part of the antidote to the pattern imposition, the fixed lens by which we, we learn, we're programmed to see things through this, this, this typical mindset. And that will depend on your parenting, your, the environment, which you grew up in the school you went to all of those things, which, which contribute to the mental lens, the mindset lens by which you view the world. Yeah. How do we practically see things from a customer's perspective? How do we practically see things from a competitor's perspective? What do you recommend, Charles, that our leaders do to, to take that different lens? Yeah, I just, I love this idea of, and again, it's, a, it's time and, you know, and, you know, as, as you said, it's always in short supply, but um, I do think we save ourselves time by getting clarity. And one of the ways to get clarity is to do in your, in your strategy workshops. And if you're not doing them, you should be doing them is to get, is to do practice perspective taking. Yeah. Um, and I'll give you an example that, uh, you know, we talk about in the book and this one's gobsmacking to me. So for the last hundred years, we've put braces on people's teeth to straighten them. Right. These awful metal braces that you glue to people's teeth and you ratchet them down and they look terrible and they're painful and they cost uh, tens of thousands of uh, pounds or dollars. It took two uh, 
university students to turn that whole thing on its head. Uh, and one of them is a friend of mine called Kelsey Worth. And uh, <clears throat> she and uh, her business partner were at business school. And he was wearing braces and he'd just gotten them off. You know, he, 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 he was from Pakistan. He couldn't afford braces till later in life. And he wanted to get his teeth straightened and he'd just gotten them off. And he noticed that when he forgot to put on his uh, retainer uh, for a couple of days, that it hurt to put it back on, but that moved his teeth back. And uh, he and Kelsey then sort of had this insight. I wonder if we could use this beautiful, clear uh, retainer technology in a series of stepped um, uh, versions, you know, com computer, 3D computer printed that would actually move our teeth, but have much more that customer curbside appeal, right? Instead of having these awful looking braces, we could do something that was nearly invisible. And that's what they, they came up with the idea of Invisalign, which is completely revolutionized orthodonty. Didn't come from an orthodontist, didn't come from a dentist. Yeah. Now it's a $20 billion business. Yeah. And uh, it's changed everything. It's changed the power between orthodontists and dentists because even yeah. dentists can prescribe this, right? It's made, it's democratized this. Yeah. Um, it's just such a beautiful story. And it, you know, it just, it, it shows you why companies get disrupted because they don't bother to take the perspective of their customer. What we deliver is braces. No, what you deliver is straight teeth and beautiful curbside appeal along the way. Yeah, which goes back to the question, why are we doing this? Why are we yeah. doing this? Yeah. Is there so, a better way to do this? Absolutely. And the better way was, in that instance was ultimately on earth because the gentleman uh, had, uh, or, or lady rather had an issue that was causing her pain, literal pain in terms of actually putting the, the retainers back on, which triggered then a catalyst of, of steps or, or thought processes, which ultimately arrived at the point where they created the Invisalign product. And for those who are leading businesses who aren't experiencing the pain and often pain is the catalyst for change. How can we actually use that pain or unearth or discover that pain to actually create a new lens by which we view things? Well, I mean, there's nothing better than actually becoming a customer, right? Yeah. So, you know, <clears throat> the one, the woman who runs Diddy, she's called Jean Lou. She drives for Diddy. Um, my friend Dara Kazwashahi, who runs Uber, he drives for Uber, right? Then he understands the perspective of two of the critical constituents for their business, right? Which is the drivers and why they drive and, you know, whether they're independent contractors or employees, which market you're talking about. And then the end customer, because he sees the frustrations of how the system works. If, if a CEO or actually anybody in a company can actually step into that role as customer. You know, at Patagonia, all of the people who work for Patagonia are passionate outdoors people, right? So as soon as they are not working, they're out surfing or skiing or mountain climbing or fishing, and they're trying to break the gear, right? I mean, that's we, we talk about that all the time. They're trying to break the gear because when you break the gear, you understand where the fault points are, yeah. right? And that's the best way. Yeah. You're together. Step in. We don't yeah. take the time. I yeah. mean, how many CEOs really go on sales calls? No. Go on a sales call. I dare you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and even yeah. that, ask your customers, you know, spend that time. And I think this is a challenge yeah. as we continue to scale. We spend more time in the boardroom uh looking at powerpoint presentations that we actually then we actually do pressing flesh with our customers which got us to the point where we were successful in the first instance that's right and we assume then again because we're pattern imposers that whatever got us here is what keeps us here yeah. and it just isn't true yeah so let's move on to to the third mindset pursuing occurrent behavior with restless experimenting. I know we've touched on the, the importance of, of experimentalism um, so far, but can you explain what this, that this statement is occurrent, pursuing occurrent behavior? 
Yeah, sort of a funny term, isn't it? And um, a current behavior is what actually happens, not what you expected to happen or hoped would happen. And I remember when I was a young management consultant, you know, the first thing we do is we run out and try and buy a data set. Uh, we're trying to solve a particular problem. You go to these data providers and, you know, you would never stop to think, hey, <clears throat> if I can buy this data set, anybody can buy this data set. And I'll, maybe my analytic technology is better, but the truth is, if you're working with existing data, you're working with something that's already in the past and something that other people can see too. What we want to encourage folks to do is gather their own data. And I think sometimes people think, oh yeah, experiment, that's that's really just for internet companies because you can put up you know, interface A and interface B and you can see which one drives uh, higher engagement or you can put up sales offer A, sales offer B and sales offer C and you can see which one uh, moves the dial. But I think we, almost all of our businesses could be experimentalists if they were willing. And one of my favorite examples and one we talk about in the book um, is uh, SpaceX, we're the ultimate heavy industry. What's heavier than trying to send payloads into space, right? These guys have totally revolutionized sending things into space. And you'd say like NASA had a 70 year head start. How could they do that? Well, the answer is instead of sending two, three, four payloads into space a year, missions a year, as NASA was doing, they started there and then they ramped up to between 20 and 30 times a year. Each time they do it, they're testing something new. I wonder if I can 3D print parts. I wonder if I can use a net to catch the nose cone so I don't lose that. I wonder if I can use this material that was developed in automotive technology for heat shielding in a rocket. Every time they do it, they're testing something. Now, most recently and spectacularly, they had, what was it called? An unplanned disassembly or an unscheduled disassembly. <laughs> so obviously this is a multi-hundred million dollar sort of experiment, but they even said it in advance. They said, hey, this might go wrong. Um, and they accept that to make progress traveling down this experience curve, they actually have to break things. And of course they don't put people on those rockets. They make sure, or animals, they make sure to test those things ahead of time. But that's allowed them to lower the cost of sending a kilogram into space by 95%, 95%, right? Over the course of 20 years, it's amazing. I mean, this is an amazing story and it shows experimentation isn't outside of your fingertips if you work in, steel or chemicals or plastics or any, any heavy industry, yeah. right? And if you work as we do at Patagonia in um, clothing and gear, you should be experimenting, experimenting all the time. You should be constant experimentalists, right? And you, you know, get your best people. These are the pros, the people who operate every day, the ski guide or the fishing guide, right? Put stuff in their hands and let them break it, right? And then they'll come back to you and say, here's what I love about this zipper but the zipper keeps failing yeah. right or here's what i love about this but it's a bit short or what's going on with your sizing or this th after three washings this doesn't shed water anymore right. yeah for many smes and i can relate to this now I, I didn't have language around it but we were pursuing a current behavior by selling things which we hadn't yet developed, uh, working, working in the, the heavy engineering space, designing manufacturing equipment to process construction and demolition waste. But often we were selling concepts and then experimenting uh, on site. Yeah, and as long as you're honest about what you're doing, right? you know, and that's when you say, look, I'm gonna bid this contract low um, and here's the reason. And I'm, and I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not gonna make money on this one but I want to try these three new things. Are you good with that? Yeah. Yeah. Just make it, make your customer partner to what you're doing, right? That's why we work with our pros when yeah. we're doing uh, product testing. Yeah. I love that. It brings me back actually, you know, some of our real customer advocates going back to my previous role, they would approach us and say, could you try this through the machine? Have you, have you tried yeah. this before? We said, no, we haven't, but actually, why not try it? We'll, we'll send a couple of our engineers across, you know, we'll, 
you know, we'll, we'll test that material. We capture some of the results right. and, and, right. and they really loved that interaction that we were right. co-creating, co-experimenting with them to, to break new ground. Right. And you were focused on getting a better outcome. You weren't just focused on margin yeah. and when your brain's just on margin. Yeah. All you're thinking about doing is cutting corners. You're not thinking about the best outcome. Yeah. And, and again, one of the challenges to, to the mindsets that you've laid out is the fact that often when, when we become more successful, the focus becomes, or the focus comes to the bottom line, yeah. comes to the results because yeah. there's more, I say more eyes on the results now. Right. How do you, how do you guys, how have you balanced that in Patagonia? Well, you know, Patagonia has been privately owned by a single family for all of its existence until last year. And then the family transferred all the shares to charitable entities to uh, fight climate change and species extinction. So it had the great benefit of not having public shareholders who only cared about money. You had a group of people who actually didn't care about money at all. Yeah. All, all they cared about was making the best gear, doing the least environmental harm. Yeah. And using using business as a catalytic force for creating environmental change, right? That's what drove the company until 2018. And then the mission became even simpler, which is we're in business to save the home planet. And that's what led to them giving all the shares away, right? So it helps when you don't have um, people who don't care about your purpose breathing down your neck. Yeah, paradoxically, in that instance, again, we don't have insight to the results as such, but given what I've seen in the press, uh, the the more Patagonia focused on purpose, the more profitable they became. Absolutely. And Yvonne says that. He says, every time I do the right thing, it's good for business. Yeah. Think about that. And so you'd say, like, how how is it? Very few brands survive 50 years, let alone have the kind of uh, brand recognition. Patagonia, once again, was the number one brand in the in the consumer satisfaction um, survey. So how does that happen? And I think it happens by doing the right thing, yeah. by being authentic, by standing for something and never compromising on that. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it brings me back to the strap line from Marga Hoek's book. We interviewed Marga in season one. How, uh, she authored the book, The, the Trillion Dollar Shift, and a wonderful book exploring how the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and a focus on those can actually create more opportunities for business to not only make a significant impact in the world, but also become more profitable. And she said, you know, business for good is good for business. So... We come on to the the fourth, uh, or the fifth, uh, tapping into collective intelligence, acknowledging that the smartest people are not in the room. Yeah, this is super important. Um, you know, you can you can be curious, you can look at things from multiple perspectives, you can do experiments, but you also need to be honest and to say, especially in an SME, you might not have the world's best engineer, or, or you may not even have money to have a, an artificial intelligence engineer on your staff. Right. So what I, I, I love this idea and, the, you know, we credit uh, Bill Joy, you know, is one of the famous founders of Sun Microsystems. Before that, he was at Berkeley and he was one of the parents who developed the Unix operating system. And that operating system is still the kernel code that's in Microsoft and Apple's operating systems and many others. Right. He had this insight, which is the best people probably aren't in your room. But how can I get them laboring in my garden? And that led him to be part of a movement that was called open source software, which is still incredibly important today. And, you know, all the big companies, Microsoft, you know, which is, you know, the king of proprietary software for the last mile, that's specific customer applications, also supports um, uh, in lots of ways open source software, because that's where we come together to solve the really big problems that no single company can probably solve on its own. If you extend that idea and say, well, what about using um, crowdsourcing uh, uh, platforms like Kegel? You know, so example in the book that I love, Nature Conservancy, not a business, um, not full of uh, artificial intelligence engineers, but it had a problem. It wanted to, it's a, a board fishing boats. 
you're ca when you're out there with nets or with lines, you're capturing some fish that are okay to keep, that are sustainable. And so you're catching some fish that you really should put back very quickly. How do you do it, right? So what if you put video cameras on the boats? What Does that help you? Well, you're bouncing up and down, there's rain coming down. How can you quickly identify fish? So they used Kegel, they put $150,000 prize which, by the way, they'd gotten from winning a prize for being the best, you know, uh, <clears throat> nonprofit. They put up that dough. They got 3,000 entries. And the winning entry used a computer vision algorithm that looked at the shape of gills, looked at the, the shape of fins, and was able to instantly identify whether the fish was a fish you should put back in the water carefully or one that it was okay to keep. What a brilliant idea. Didn't have that in-house weren't embarrassed that they didn't have that in-house, paid a relatively small amount of money to get a huge amount of great ideas. I mean, that's that's this mindset at work, right? Yeah. And yeah. inside big companies especially, we're arrogant. We think we've got the best people, right? In little companies, we often know better. <laughs> <laughs> we know better. Larry and Shippy, he's pretty good. But wouldn't it be great if Larry could stand, you know, shoulder to shoulder with the best people too? And you know, and we can do that by inviting outside ideas in through these various approaches. Yeah, again, this resonates so strongly. Humility is a thread that runs through all of this. You yeah, know, the, the humility to to ask what is perceived as stupid questions, the humility to to not impose your view on the world, but to think that there might be another perspective, the humility to say, well, we mightn't have got this 100% right, but you know what, we're going to experiment, we're going to give it a go. We know that maybe by the, the, the 20th iteration, we'll get there. But that humility, you know, it comes back to the essence of imperfectionism, humility undergirds that I feel. What's your thoughts on that, Charles? I mean, I just love that. And, you know, it's funny, I was just smiling because I was reflecting on what kind of a person I was at 25. You know, I was never in doubt. I, you know, I was a type A analytic and I was a great problem solver and I thought I knew everything. And uh, maybe it's just, you know, life has all kinds of little failures. And, you know, you can either write those off as uh, one-offs or you can write them off as bad luck, right? And if you do that, you're fooling yourself. Right. You need to, we should love our failures just as much as we love our successes. And by loving our failures, we learn. But hopefully we also learn to be humble. Yeah. Right. There's a story, you know, and I don't know whether this is true or not, but uh, Mr. Toyota, who was the founder of Toyota, the, the car company, he had a transmission part on his desk and a journalist came in and said, what's that? He said, oh, it's a, you know, it's a, a auto transmission. He said, was that like your 100 millionth uh, auto transmission? He said, no, no, it's, uh, it's a failed auto transmission. It's uh, one in 10,000. And he said, why would you put a monument to failure on your desk? He said, I learned from that failure every single day. I love that. Yeah, we visited. I took a delegation of CEOs to, to uh, Toyota a number of months back. And even the fact that Mr. Toyota... Uh, changed the company name to yeah. Toyota was a a sign of the man's humility because he said, "I don't want, I don't own this company. If, if it bears my name, then there there are connotations to to this company." And he changed it to, to Toyota. And in Japanese, Toyota has ten stro ten pen strokes, I believe, which is a complete symbol. And Toyota has eight which is a sign of incompleteness that there's more yet to be done and I, oh, that's beautiful that's yeah. beautiful that there's that japanese concept that uh, we talk about in the book it's wabi sabi yeah which is you know the beauty of imperfection yeah yeah and uh i just i love that idea and i think the japanese are in fact very very good at this absolutely and you know another take on that is kintsugi it's that uh you know uh, dressing up those imperfections with yeah. with gold, which is really yeah. amplifying the imperfections. It's uh, which which I love. Uh, so, you know, the the power of collective intelligence. And I was smiling as you're saying that because when I was reading the book, I took a, a photograph of of actually that um, concept of open innovation that 
mm. that that uh, crowdsourcing and shared it with uh, the CEO of a company that I sit on the board of because we're challenged with a with a with a, a problem at the moment which requires significant resources to innovate and i shared this concept with them and we're now exploring the the idea of actually putting this out as a competition so thank you for that excellent <laughs> excellent so moving on to to show and tell yeah well so i think people assume once you've done you know these other bits and pieces and you've put it all together to step into risk that it'll just stand by itself. And of course, that isn't the case. Um, in all organizations, you have to rally people uh, behind you to build support for your idea. And in good organizations, there should be lots of competing ideas. And <clears throat> as you said earlier in the piece, and I just loved it, which is, what do we do? Wow, well, we create a bunch of PowerPoints. PowerPoints are great. If you didn't have PowerPoint, you'd invent it. But PowerPoint is terrible at actually telling stories. And humans are storytellers. In fact, they're usually visual storytellers. And it just always surprised me how little effort, you know, you do all this work to come up with a great strategy, how little effort people put into building support for the strategy, right? And we don't step back and ask ourselves, how do we speak to people's hearts, not just their minds? Because if you really want to line people up behind something and get their shoulder against it, you've got to speak to their hearts as well. And that's where storytelling comes in, and especially visual storytelling. One of the examples from the book is one I love. My um, co-author, Rob McLean, uh, was working with the Nature Conservancy in Australia. They were trying to convince the big bank, their charitable arm, that they should support a project to invest in shellfish reefs inside estuaries. And they, they once all existed, by the way, and we pull all, all that stuff up. Estuaries are where freshwater meets saltwater, and we often get runoff and you get these algal blooms. And you know this is the place where life happens and yet pollution really hurts it. If you put in place an oyster reef, those <clears throat> oysters filter an enormous amount of that, uh, of that waste or, or that pollution. The guys, all of the bank walks into the room, there's 17 big green plastic buckets stacked, stacked up in a pyramid at the back of the room. Each bucket holds 10 liters. And of course, everyone's instantly riveted. What's going on? What are these buckets? And of course, you know, the punchline here is each oyster, each single oyster filters 170 liters, 17 bucket worths every single day. And just by that little visual, you know, um, prompt to tell the story, they had them. It, it's a hook and they got them in their hearts as well as their minds, right? Yeah. And when you want to sell your stories, think about that. I love that. Uh, it brings me back to something I'd read recently. We are, we are biological animals, not logical uh, we, right. we might think we're, we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're intellectual, but ultimately decisions are made through our emotions. Well, I'm glad you said that too, because like, I also think, um, we ought to be thinking about our future generations more, right? We're, and what's the one thing, you know, you care about more than anything else, your kids and the chance that they have, right? And when people have health security, then they think about their kids and they think about what jobs they'll have and they start caring about the environment. And when people are worried about their kids' health, they burn the planet down. And we do, and we do. And that's why if you think like a biological creature, right, then maybe we'd be thinking about profit as something that's not in my pocket today, but which is a sustainable job in the future for my children and their children, right? And if you think that way, there's no separation between what's good for your business and what's good for the planet. They have to be the same. I love that. Yeah. So profound. You bring the framework together with the, the title of the book uh, in terms of the imperfectionist, being an imperfectionist with a high tolerance for ambiguity. And when I read this, I thought of, I interviewed Michael Gelb again, back maybe season three or season four. Michael is the author of Becoming Leonardo da Vinci. And he cites seven principles that undergirded 
arguably the greatest genius of all time. And Sfamato was one of those Italian principles, which is Leonardo's ability to deal with ambiguity. So yeah. I, I love the fact that actually this is what you've called out. So uh, can you kind of bring it together now in the context of, I suppose, a call to action for the leaders out there to become more imperfect? <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, I think the way this all comes together is this concept of imperfectionism and, you know, that the call to action is to go ahead and step into risk. Um, yes, of course, you know, you study it, um, you take a look, uh, you figure out what the right first couple of steps should be. And by the way, usually I think you should pursue multiple initiatives at the same time. Not, not it's like if you're playing roulette, you probably don't put everything on red 18. Um, run several horses in the race at the same time. And as long as you can keep the uh, the consequences or the expenditures associated with each of those experiments relatively small, and as long as they're reversible, this is an idea that Amazon uses all the time, as long as I can go back through the door if I don't like it, to go ahead and step out, you learn a whole bunch about the game that's being played. You... Um, build capabilities, you often add assets, even if you fail at that particular step. So my favorite example, which brings it all together, is Amazon getting into consumer financial services. Oh, they had the biggest balance sheet, one of the biggest balance sheets in the world. They could have just bought a big bank or a big consumer finance company, but they didn't. They made a little investment in a small fintech company. They hired a team from another failed fintech company. They had a little in, uh, internal initiative to create something like the terminal that uh, that Square developed, now called Cube. Each one of those things failed in and of themselves. Those don't exist today. But that created the first confidence, capabilities, and assets to allow Amazon to build a staircase, your kind of idea of scaling, right? You often think about a staircase or multiple staircases. Some of the steps don't work. But today they've got a 24% payment share across the e-commerce economy in the United States. I mean, that's incredible. They didn't do it with a grand strategic plan. They didn't do it with their giant balance. They did it by stepping into risk and by being smart about what they learned. And they didn't punish people for small mistakes as long as they were good bets. I was sharing with you at the outset the statistics on scaling and the statistics that we have are those relating to the UK. We don't seem to have any beyond the UK. Uh, these are statistics borne out by the Scale Up Institute. And long term listeners of the show will know I cite this statistic often because it's so compelling. There are 5.7 million small to medium sized enterprises in the UK alone and they contribute over two trillion pounds worth of revenue to the UK economy. So there's the significant part of the, the business ecosystem, more than 90% of uh, businesses by volume are small and medium sized enterprises and more than 70% of the workforce work for SMEs. Now less than, than 1% of those businesses, a mere 34,000 are contributing more than half of that revenue. They're contributing almost 1.2 trillion pounds. So positively disproportionate. What we want to do here is actually turn the dial up on those, you know, move the 34,000 to 50,000 to 100,000. What's the prize? How do we, lack of ambition is cited as the single greatest impediment as to why, you know, SME leaders don't scale, which is really a mindset. What would, what would your appeal be to those SME leaders, Charles, who are, let's say, stuck? Yeah. Well, you know, and it's, I'll just, I, I, at, the, at the risk of repetition, you know, like find small experiments that don't bet the farm, but which, but yeah. which do tell you about something you don't know. So often small businesses start by doing something really well, but then they don't innovate on that. Because they're afraid, you know, because of course things are tight in small businesses. They don't want to borrow money from the bank and they just keep doing that thing. And actually the world leaves them behind. The buggy whip manufacturer didn't notice that automobiles were coming, right? They keep making good buggy whips, thought making buggy whips. Look at what's coming up the pipe. And I do think that there's a class of experiments 
that are relatively small in cost and relatively reversible that any small business can aim for. I do think part of it comes from aspiring to something bigger than where you are today. And, um, you know, that's a hard thing to sort of, you know, encourage people to do, but I think it's important. Wouldn't it be an amazing thing if you could turn that dial that you just described? Because those small businesses, which are embedded in their communities, that care about their staff, that by definition care about the environments in which they operate, if you could scale them, you'd be scaling businesses that actually have a purpose rather than scaling these um, you know, global behemoths that actually don't care about you. Somebody said the other day, and I, and, and I can't remember who said it originally, but it, you know, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Well, when you're, when you're a customer of uh, you know, the big internet companies, you're on the menu, yeah. right? Yeah. And if we could scale small enterprise um, that are fundamentally based in purpose, not just based in profit, we could be doing something really good. Here, here. And speaking of a company who has and continues to scale with purpose, the wonderful Patagonia, it would be remiss of me not to, to dig in a little bit to, to understand what has really undergirded and driven the success of Patagonia, a company that I refer to very often, both on this podcast and throughout uh the coaching within our own program as a an exemplar of a company who has scaled with purpose what do you believe are the key or you know what do you what have you come to understand as the key principles that have contributed to patagonia's sustained success since its origins in what 1973 yeah well i think it's um i think it's straightforward i really do and i i you know you have in yvonne chenard uh didn't go to a fancy business school um, he, he, his business grew out of his passion, which was, you know, human powered outdoor sport, which started for him with a uh, rock climbing. And originally he made a piton because it was expensive to buy a piton with a, with a secondhand blacksmith, um, smithy that he purchased and operated in his dad's backyard. Um, how did this fellow build a business that everyone knows the name of today? Um, he did it uh, by a fanatical devotion to quality, to make the very best things, uh, not driven by profit, driven by making the best stuff, as if he was making it for himself and his friends, because of course that's where he started. And then very quickly, uh, he and his wife, uh, Melinda, and then their, their kids, began to realize that, so for example, pitons actually damage rock. And so early on, they developed this environmental consciousness inside the company, which became very quickly build the best gear, do the least harm, right? And then, and then use business to catalyze change, right? Ultimately, that was supplanted by an even bigger mission in 2018, which is we're in business to save the home planet. But that... The reason for success is fanatical devotion to quality, not profit, and devotion to purpose that's much bigger than any single business, and then remaining authentic to that every single day. And so when you do something good in Patagonia, <clears throat> Yvonne says, good, not good enough. We can do better. It's a hard thing to hear sometimes. It's a hard thing to hear sometimes. <laughs> But, uh, but uh, you know, you don't get you don't get to be a Patagonia if you don't say, how can I do it better? Is there a better way to do it? Is there another way to do it? And he's a curious he's a curious tinkerer, just as he always was. Yeah, a curious tinkerer. There's some wonderful uh, photographs, old photographs that he has shared in his wonderful book, Let My People Go Surfing. Uh, often when I bring up Patagonia as a as a case study or as an exemplar of a company scaling with purpose. Certainly, the the SME leaders that that I have the privilege of coaching through our own program. So, you know, yeah, that but that's Patagonia. It's you know, it's just too abstract. They're just too big. They're you know, they uh, um, what you've described beautifully is the fact that it didn't start that way. It didn't, you know, he, uh, Yvonne didn't start out to save the planet. He started with an obsession of 
uh, creating the best quality peat on that he could. So I think of this as a focus on on competence, your core competence. What you know, what do you want to be known for in terms of the the product or service that you're bringing to the market? That, as I you know, I'm piecing this together from what I've read, what I've heard, you know, that created a, a cult following, which you know started to create a culture around these products that was creating, which ultimately led to to a cause. So you have these stepping stones of competence, culture, cause, which is the Patagonia that people can relate to today. But the old photographs go back to, you know, picturing Yvonne in that blacksmith's forge, uh, fabricating the Piton product. Does that kind of, does that journey resonate? You know, have, have I, have I interpreted that correctly, George, yeah. in terms of the Yes, absolutely. I mean, and I, I, I think um, every single business can take that first step. And um, <clears throat> I think it's um, Patagonia is a perfect example because it wasn't born of any special privilege, right? It was, it was literally forged, we'll use the term, day by day with a commitment to quality and a commitment to purpose. Yeah. It's as simple as that. It's one step in front of the other. Right. And <clears throat> when I first got involved, the business was a tenth of the size that it is today. Congratulations. Uh, you really are leading the way. I absolutely love the product. I love your brand message as well, uh, in terms of, you know, if, you know, if you don't need to buy this product, if you've already got this, don't, don't buy it. Uh, it's, it's contrary to the point where it, 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 it it attracts me to want to buy it more. Did you think of that? Was that deliberate? When I you assure that you that was, uh, that was that was no part that was no part of the motivation of that particular uh, campaign. The family feels very um, ambiguous about growth, and I take no credit for this. All, all credit goes to uh, Yvonne and his family. They feel ambiguous about growth. They do not want growth for growth's sake. They want <clears throat> growth to come from authentically producing the best gear doing the least environmental damage while making that gear and really making their company stand for something that's much bigger than just making money. And um, I think, you know, that at its heart is the right, is the, is the right formula. Yeah. And you, you've alluded to it throughout. The company was gifted into a trust recently uh, and the beneficiary of that trust is ultimately the planet. Can you, can you share a little bit around that before we move into our close? Yeah, well, <clears throat> you know, they, uh, Yvonne in 2018 said, we got to lift the bar again. And so well, what do you mean? He said, you know, we're, we're doing good, but we're not doing great. We need to be putting more wood against the ball, you know, baseball or cricket analogy as you like, hockey analogy, I guess, in Ireland. Uh, the, and he changed the mission to we're in business to save the home planet. He raised the bar <clears throat> and then he asked us, how can we ensure the next 50 years of stewardship for Patagonia? How can we how can we put more of the profit of the company against the environmental crisis? And, you know, we scratched our head and we spent two years working on this uh, question. We looked at all kinds of different options, including going public with dual class shares and trying to control the future of the company that way, but putting lots of the cash against the environment. And none of that stuff actually felt right. It, it didn't feel right. And so the family just, uh, they literally transferred all of their shares into a charitable, two charitable entities. One's called a perpetual purpose trust, which gives you a sense for, you know, what, what it's about. And the other is a C4 called the Holdfast Collective. They walked away from all the money so that the, all the profitability of the company that's not required to reinvest in the company goes to fighting the environmental crisis, right? And, you know, that's the ultimate um, putting, putting purpose ahead of profit. I will say that, you know, lots of people could mimic this without giving away every share, right? You know, MasterCard is 10% or 9% owned by the MasterCard Foundation. So you can do good without being going as far as uh, the Chouinard family did. I do notice that Michael Bloomberg, you know, who's got a $60 billion business, he's just done the same, he's been transferring all the shares to charitable entity doesn't imagine if we could create a movement where um 
we transfer at least part of the shares of every entity on behalf of the planet and future generations. Think about how we'd make our decisions differently if our shareholders weren't some faceless corporation uh, or investment trust, but actually you imagine every decision being one that does something good for the planet. Well, I wasn't aware of the decision that Bloomberg had taken recently. It always takes somebody to break new ground. Yvonne Schoenard and Patagonia have certainly done that in so many different ways. Uh, so delighted to hear now that others are following and ultimately uh, okay. they, they, it, won't, it won't be the last. Uh, before before I, I wrap up, uh, is, there, is there a piece of advice you can give to the SME leaders to who see uh, Patagonia's sustainability success as, as unattainable, what would you what would you advise them to do at this yeah. stage? Yeah, so it's, I think it's simple. Um, <clears throat> stand for something that's important, that's bigger than you. Yeah. Be curious every single day. Ask a bunch of questions about whether you're doing the right thing or whether you're doing it the right way, and then don't be afraid to lean into risk. With small, with small experiments so that you actually improve what you're doing. Um, it's by experimentation that we improve what we're doing. Um, if you've got a success formula, don't rest on it. <laughs> uh, so look, is there anything else you want to share before we move into the closed charts in the, in the context of, of uh, becoming an imperfectionist? I've probably said enough. I mean, you know, I, I you know, the, this is a, this is every business needs to travel its own journey. Um, and I don't think there's a one size fit all. I do think these are some pretty good principles um, to build uh, success in. Yeah. I recommend that everyone goes out and, and gets a copy of the book. Uh, I love a good framework <laughs> and uh, I, the, the, the structure and the logic behind these and the wonderful storytelling to support them is it, it makes the book just uh, very, very, very engaging. So thank you for that. Uh, you've had an incredible career to date. Uh, and, you know, your, your, your bio is, is so rich. Can you provide our audience with three timeless takeaways? Yeah. Um, I guess uh, for me, the takeaways are about purpose. Um, and I think more about that um, as I get older. You know, I'm not interested in doing businesses that are just good businesses, but doing businesses that do something important in the world. And I don't need to fill in what that is for folks, but they, they ought to fill that in for themselves. And then I've been thinking a lot about character. Um, and I do think character, our character needs to be built around purpose. Um, and a you know, character comes from doing the right thing, even when people aren't looking. And then the third thing will sound even more old fashioned, which is, I think ultimately, that character gets built on idea, uh, an idea called virtue. Um, and everyone's notion of what virtue is will be different. And I'm not trying to define yours, but things like authenticity and courage and grace are all descriptions of virtues um, that I think will stand people well. And, you know, you should pick the right set for you. But um, I don't want to live in a world where people don't operate with purpose and where individuals don't, um, uh, aren't, don't operate with character and that that character is based in doing the right things. Here, here, as Banky Moon said, there is no planet B. Uh, you know, we're all sharing this space, the yeah. 8 billion of us, and uh, it's so yeah. important that given the impact that that SME leaders have the businesses have that we that we do seek to bring our wonderful product our service to the world in a purposeful impactful way Charles what's next for you well you know I'm enjoying what I'm doing now I mean I, I have a you know very rich experience um I I invest in uh, life sciences companies that I think are really interesting that will contribute to um, human health and health security. I get to work with Patagonia and I work with a number of other companies. Um, I think the next intellectual journey is a journey around the topics that I just mentioned, which is how can we do um, more authentic purpose 
And how can we be more invested in that ourselves? Because I think that's what ultimately provides meaning um, in our lives. So that's that's my next uh, intellectual journey. Brilliant. Sure. Well, look, I, I, I look forward to, to hearing more from you, whether it be in this medium or certainly the, the, the written word. If anyone wants to connect with you, Charles, find out more about your work, where best to reach you. I'm easily found on LinkedIn and uh, I often post on LinkedIn. I think that's a pretty good place. Brilliant. Yeah. I want to thank you sincerely for your, your time your energy, your rich wisdom today. I have thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. It has absolutely flown. Charles, I wish you every success in, in everything that you're, you're doing. It's wonderful. It's, it's everything you describe. It's purposeful. It's full of character. It's steeped in virtue, authenticity. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Brennan. I loved every minute.